So welcome to today's class. We're going to do approach to white cell abnormalities. Um, the rationale for this particular objective is that white cell, that is the neutrophils and the lymphocyte abnormalities include abnormalities of the number. So it can be leukocytosis or leukopenia. That is excessive white cells or less white cells and their function. So the abnormalities can be due to the number or the function, right? So leukocytosis and leukopenia may occasionally indicate serious and potentially urgent medical problems. Congenital white cell dysfunction is rare, but acquired dysfunction is associated with common medical problems. So this is just, you know, an introduction to this particular objective. And it now gives you the causal conditions, like on the objective itself. And this is where a lot of people don't get it. This is where, you know, you use this objective as a study tool so you can really master stuff, okay? So you can have, we call we are dealing with white cell abnormalities. You can have leukocytosis, you can have leukopenia. So if I were you and I'm even studying this, I'll just say that, hey, what are the causes of leukocytosis, bacterial infection? So maybe the patient has an infection, whatever the infection could be, pneumonia, you know, cellulitis, pyelonephritis, meningitis, right? So that one can be there. And infectious mononucleosis. I highlighted that because for me, it's a very, very important topic, which we need to master. Now, when it comes to infectious mononucleosis, a lot of candidates will think, oh, I know infectious mononucleosis. I know the time they don't have to go back to sports. I know we need to do monosport tests. But beyond these two things, and I know that maybe if you give amoxicillin, the patient may develop a rash. Uh, beyond these three points, what else do you know about infectious mononucleosis? And don't forget that the exam is moving towards MCQs alone. Starts April 2025. So now you just can't have general knowledge about stuff. You've got to be very deep so far as those things are concerned. Now, another cause of leukocytosis can be neoplastic. So this is where all the CLLs and the rest fall under, you know, ALL, acute lymphocytic leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So if you have even this um, alone, leukocytosis alone, you have to think about the various common bacterial infections which can present, like lung infection, brain infection, throat infection, you know, GIT infection, skin infection, bladder infection, right? And then the neoplastic ones, that's when you go to CLL, ALL, um, and then CML, AML, those ones as well. And then leukopenia. Leukopenia is decreased white cell count. So it could be due to bacterial infection as well. It could be due to HIV. So if you see somebody learning HIV in preparation for this exam, it is not fluke. It is because it is found in this particular objective. All right, and then it could also be due to decreased infective, uh, um, ineffective production by the bone marrow. So that's where you you see people like who may have like aplastic anemia. That is where it comes from as well. And then it could also be from leukocyte dysfunction, so chronic gallinatus disease and HIV features again. So doctors, with this alone, with the causal conditions alone, with the causal conditions alone, you realize that. You, can, you have at least maybe 10 topics for you to review, even before you get out of this objective. The key objectives. So now we're getting into deep stuff. The key objective. Giving a patient with white cell abnormality, the candidate will diagnose the cause, all right? The severity and the complications and will initiate an appropriate management plan. In particular, um, attention to distinguishing those conditions which are life-threatening, like overwhelming sepsis, acute leukemia, new fibro neutropenia, and require immediate treatment from those that are non-agent. Majority of the cases is with acute ma management. So if your emergency medicine is not strong, like, you know, you will struggle a bit for this exam. So now the enabling objective, giving a patient with abnormalities of white cell count, white blood cells, the candidate will listen and interpret the critical clinical findings, including those derived from a relevant history and appropriate physical exam. Okay, so all the cases I mentioned, whether infectious mononucleosis, whether it is acute chronic, um, uh, acute lymphocytic leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, fibro neutropenia, HIV, granulomatous disease, you must know the historical presentation of these cases. That's number one. 
Number two, an assessment of urgent life-threatening situations which will require immediate intervention. That's also something you need to master. Okay, and then list and interpret the critical investigations, including the context of the clinical presentation, like a monospot test, bacterial cultures. For example, in somebody who has um, sepsis, you have to do bacterial cultures, blood cultures, right? If somebody you are suspecting infectious mononucleosis, you've got to do your monospot test and construct an effective initial management plan, including referring the patient for further specific investigations and specialized care example, bone marrow biopsy, neutrophil fu function test, if necessary, and initiating treatment of underlying conditions. So doctors, it's, it's very broad because the, the, the number of topics which can fall under this is huge. So for today, I want us to pick one and delve deep into it. Infectious mononucleosis. And <laughs> while I was preparing for this class, I was like, you know what? People will roll their eyes and say, oh, but we know about infectious mononucleosis. Mm -hmm. There's a lot we are going to learn today. So please, I need you to pick your pen and your paper and make sure that wherever pearl we go, boom, you pick it up. Number one, when we're talking about infectious mononucleosis, how are you going to pick it up? And that is why I wrote this equation. Look for that patient with fever. And you know, maybe you may not be told that he's febrile, but then they may give you vitals and the temperature is high. Look for that patient with pharyngitis, throat infection, or throat pain, sorry. Look for that patient who has adenopathy, all right? Look for that patient who has fatigue, fatigue, fatigue. And then the whole issue with abnormal white cell count is the atypical lymphocytosis. Because we learned that with abnormal white cell count, we are either talking about lymphocytosis or leukopenia. If you see a clinical presentation where the patient has fever, pharyngitis, adenopathy, fatigue, and atypical lymphocytosis. These are the things you want to watch out for, which will help you to know that this is the patient's diagnosis. Let me say it again. If I see a patient with fever, pharyngitis, adenopathy, fatigue, patient is tired, atypical lymphocytosis, one of the topmost differentials which should come into my mind is infectious mononucleosis. And as we even go through this, we are going to even learn other conditions which may present as infectious mononucleosis and how these various five things will help us to say this is more likely infectious mononucleosis or less likely. So please, let's brace for impact. Okay, so what are the five things I just mentioned? Can somebody remind me of them? What are the five things I just mentioned which should cause me to think that this is infectious mononucleosis? Can somebody on mute and then just tell me right away, please? Okay, Dr. Biola, please, what are the five things we said that if we see, boom, infectious mononucleosis should be our topmost diagnosis? What are they? Okay, we said uh, fever, pharyngitis, mm -hmm. adenopathy, fatigue, and atypical lymphocytosis. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, we have to understand that the major reservoir for um, Epstein-Barr virus, which causes uh, infectious mononucleosis, is humans. All right? And how is it spread? There's, it is spread through intimate contact between susceptible persons and Epstein-Barr virus shredders. And the reason why I'm saying Epstein-Barr virus shredders is because it has been noted that um, some people or a lot of patients, after they get infectious mononucleosis, they still shed Epstein-Barr virus for quite some time, okay? So that's why I'm using um, Epstein-Barr virus shedders. Now, how infectious mononucleosis presents in various age groups? This is where you want to start getting okay. careful because of, you know, the fact that the exam is now going to focus more on MCQs come next year, okay? So in children, please note this, in children, infectious mononucleosis is often subclinical. Less than 10% of children develop clinical infection. Like, you know, they are so sick because of infectious mononucleosis. But in adolescents and adults, so as you are growing, you realize that hmm, the patient is becoming symptomatic for that. So in, in an MCQ, you know, for example, if, if I throw an MCQ to you, that, you know, which of the following is more likely to have symptoms um, of infectious mononucleosis and I throw in a three-year-old kid, a two-year-old kid, a five-year-old kid, a 13-year-old kid. You want to go for a 13-year-old kid because 
symptomatic infection is more common in adolescents and adults um, ages. All right, good. Now, how will the Epstein-Barr virus spread? Most of the time, many people know that it is spread through saliva, which many of us know. However, some literature also says that it may also spread sexually. So, especially back to, I'll, you'll, be make, you'll be seeing that I'll be referencing, you know, the, the changes in the exam a lot. Back to the fact that there, be, there are going to be changes in the exam. If I was setting a question on um, infectious mononucleosis, I would definitely quiz you on how it is spread. I would definitely do that. I would definitely quiz you on that. So after an infection with infectious mononucleosis, the viruses may be shed in salivary secretions about six months after the onset of illness. That is why I said that, look, there are some people, like the way human beings are the reservoir and they can be chronic shedders, right, of the Epstein-Barr virus. Now, I can also trick you that these are the following ways by which Epstein-Barr virus can be spread. And I'll put in breast milk. And I'll just put in breast milk. And if I put in breast milk, don't be tricked. Breastfeeding is not an important route of transmission of Epstein-Barr virus, which causes infectious mononucleosis. Breastfeeding is not an important route of transmission. So can somebody remind me, what are the two main important routes of transmission of Epstein-Barr, which leads to infectious mononucleosis. Can somebody help me, please? Can somebody help me? Saliva and sexual? Sa saliva and then, yeah, sexual contact. And breastfeeding does not. 